Hi everyone and welcome to another Gaffer in Gear. In today's episode, we're looking at a pocket light from a brand I've never heard of called uh, Pilot City. This is their Atom Cube RX7. Now, I'm not reviewing pocket lights anymore unless they have a point of difference between them and every other pocket light that's on the market. So the point of difference with this, as far as I'm aware, it is the first pocket light with DMX. All right, so first off, let's start off with how much it costs and what you get for your money, and then we'll jump straight into the DMX operation because I'm sure if you're anything like me, the only reason you've watched this past the opening titles is because you want to know about the DMX. All right, so it sells for 189 US dollars. You get the light for that. You get a very well-constructed pouch. Uh, the light's also very well-constructed, by the way. You get a USB cable, and you also get a shoe mount. Now, if you want to run the thing off DMX, you need an additional DMX cable, so that's 41 US dollars. Now, uh, you've got a choice of three pin or five pin XLR for that. Now, here's my first criticism of the system. The um, cable for the DMX is nine foot. Okay, so that's quite a lot of cable. So you've got a very compact light, uh, which you can hide on set very easily, and it comes with this massive cable. So um, that seems a little bit ridiculous to me. I would have preferred just you know, a uh, XLR straight into the USB to keep everything nice and compact so I could stick a Lumen radio receiver on the back and, and not all this um, all this junk with it. But let's go through the cable. So uh, you've got uh, DMX, um, DMX out and DMX in. You've also got USB-C in and out. So um, this one plugs into the light and this one you can use to charge the light at the same time as you've got the cable plugged in. Now, when you're charging the light, uh, you can't charge it and simultaneously run the light. As soon as you feed power in, the light will turn off and tell you on the display that it is charging. Now the light does have a built-in battery that'll power the light at full power for two and a half hours, which is quite impressive. And it also has a USB-A out here with power. So you can plug in a Lumen Radio DMX receiver and power it off that outlet. All right, so let's jump straight into the DMX operation. So what I've done is I've got a couple of rubber bands and they're holding the nine foot cable and a Lumen radio receiver onto the back. Now, as you can see here, this is where a smaller cable would have been really handy. This would have been a nice little compact unit if we could, if we just had a smaller cable. Now, this is all powering, all self-contained and powering off the internal battery, Lumen radio receiver, the whole lot. All right, so as I go over the DMX, I'll talk about the, um, the capabilities of the light. So in the DMX mode, you've got a seven channel uh, eight bit profile. Channel one selects your operation mode, so you've uh, only got three modes of operation over DMX. Mode one is CCT, which is 2,500 Kelvin to 8,500 Kelvin, so quite a good Kelvin range, and it tracks the Planckian curve. You've got a HSI mode. Now you've got your full 360 degree color wheel with that, and this unit actually has the most accurate color vectors of any light I've ever tested, you know, including its secondary color vectors. But here's the downside, it desaturates to a really bad white point because it desaturates using only RGB emitters. And the last mode of operation over DMX is RGB Daylight Tungsten. Now in your operation modes, there are no combination modes. So you don't have a CCT combined with a HSI mode. So you can't do a slow transition to a color, for example, from white light, you have to do a hard cross. All right, so let's uh, cross over to this now on DMX and see how she operates. All right, so at the moment, it's at the base Kelvin of uh, 2,500 Kelvin. Let's do a five second fade to black, see how smooth she is. Let's do a five second fade up. Okay, let's change that to two and a half seconds, see how she goes, see if, see if it's smooth. Two and a half second fade up. Now let's see if it gets jerky if we change that to one second. Okay, so its fades are pretty pretty smooth. All right, now let's have a look at its CCT, how it goes from one Kelvin to another. And we're gonna do that over five seconds starting at the base Kelvin. All right, so let's do this over five seconds. All right, let's go back the other way at two and a half seconds. 
That's pretty smooth. It's a little bit jerky, but it's pretty smooth. And let's have a look at one second. Okay, so now I'm in HSI mode and I'm just having a play around with the colors. Now, one thing that genuinely surprises me with it is just operating it by finger. It is very, very responsive to command. So I'm quite impressed with that, you know, for the price of the unit. And considering that it's running off of 8-bit profiling uh, over Lumen Radio, um, you know, pretty impressive, you know, especially for the price. Now, let's take all the, um, all the crap off the back and we'll go through the other modes it has that are available with manual operation which includes a gels library, which at this stage has about 60 Roscoe gels in it. You've also got some special effects and a CIE mode. Now I've taken all the stuff off the back so we can see the unit, and I've also put it into a magic arm configuration so that I can hold it in place while I operate it and while I film it at the same time. All right, so let's have a quick look over the light. Now the light is a very solid alloy construction with heat sinking on the sides. At the top we have our on off switch which is a slider. Next to that is a set button which I'll go through in a sec. On the side here we have our main roller which is for our brightness. Now it's currently operating in CCT mode. So that's our brightness controller. If we want to adjust our CCT which at the moment is 5700 Kelvin we have a rocker down here which we can move upwards or downwards. Now whatever is highlighted in solid is what is adjusted by that rocker. Now if I want to change what we're adjusting on that rocker, I push the rocker in. So when I push the rocker in, whatever is highlighted is changing. So at the moment that's our Kelvin. If I press it in again, we go to, what's that, DFS on and off. Now I've got no idea what DFS is, I must confess. So let's press the function button in to get to our next uh, adjustment option, which is our plus minus green. And the unit does adjust in 100 increments of plus minus green. Now, if I press the function button in again, we can adjust our dimmer curve from linear, S curve, logarithmic, exponential. Now, I just realized I got a bit excited and skipped a few things. So on the side of the unit here, we've got a USB-C port. Underneath here, we've got a USB-A port. We've got a mounting thread. And on this side, we've got three mounting threads. Okay, now if we want to change to the next mode, we press our set button up the top. And that gets us into our main menu. And now we can use the scroller to go up and down the menu. So let's select our HSI mode by pressing in. And now we're in the HSI mode. So our roller here is still our brightness. Now I can select with the scroller what it is I'm changing. So I can select our hue. So I can do individual movements, one degree vectors, or I can hold it down and it can scroll. So very straightforward. If I want to adjust our saturation, then I press the button again to get to saturation. And I can desaturate in 1% increments. Now when I desaturate it, it desaturates to a really terrible blue. It's about 19,000 Kelvin. So that's because it's desaturating to an RGB mix. Now the next mode of operation is red, green, blue, daylight and tungsten. Okay, so we can adjust our individual red, green, blue, daylight and tungsten values. Now to select what it is we're changing, you press the function button and that scrolls through. Now we can also change our dimmer mode, whether we're linear or um, uh, logarithmic exponential. All right, so let's just add some blue in to show you. Okay, so let's just dial up some blue. Now it does dial in on a, a scale from zero to 255. So that's to tie in with DMX values. And your brightness control for your master brightness is the roller up here. Now the next mode of operation is called CIE. Now CIE mode is actually XY coordinate values. CIE 1931 refers to the graph that we're using for the CIE coordinates. All right, so in this mode, you can use your toggler to dial up or down your values. So at the moment we're changing our X value. And if we want to change our Y value, I just press the toggler in and now, then I can adjust the Y value. Now the thing to note with the XY uh, mode here is that it is only using the RGB color emitters. So it's not going to be a good mode to match in with say a sky panel or a more sophisticated light that has an XY mode. Now the next set of functions is called scenario, which is your special effects. 
Now to navigate through this menu, use the function rocker to select your effect up and down. If you've got the effect that you want, press, uh, so we're in lightning now, let's press that down. And we can select into a sub menu here, whether we're lightning effect A or B. So let's select, um, let's select B. Now if you want to go backwards through the menu, you press the set button. Okay, so the set button goes back in the menu and the function button goes forward. So very, very simple to operate. All right, let's, uh, let's turn the lights off in here and have a quick look. All right, so just before we go into the effects, just a flash warning for anybody who's photo epileptic. Okay, so let's start off with the lightning effects. Now in the lightning effects, you've got a choice of three patterns. So this is lightning effect mode A. This is lightning effect mode B. Now one thing I want to point out here is I'm filming this with a very slow rolling uh, shutter on a mobile phone. Okay, let's have a look at mode C. Uh, a lot of um, lighting effects that do lightning, the effects tend to happen so fast that you get uh, frame tearing with uh, slow shutters. Now we're in our color circle mode and this is the full color option, which is a color chase. And also in the color circle menu is a party option. This is the police light mode and I've got it set to red and blue. Now in the police car mode, you can't adjust the cadence, the, the rate at which it happens. You can adjust the speed, but you can't adjust how many times a second it flashes. And this is the fire mode. So in the fire mode, you've got a choice of flame or candle. And this is running at 50%. And this one is television. The television one looks quite convincing for me. Now you've got two choices of television. So this is a sort of black and white mode. And the second mode has coloring in it. Now for me, when I'm running a TV effect, I tend to not run colors because that tends to mess up with the editing. I prefer to run um, a, a TV effect that doesn't have any colors going through it, unless it's a, a basic CCT color change, not a hue color change. The next mode of operation is the gels menu. In the gels menu, you've got a choice of Storaro or Cinelux family of gels. You can then scroll down and select your gel number. And you can select your base Kelvin, whether it's 32 or 5600. All right, so let's have a quick scroll through. You've only got about 60 gels in total. All right, so let's just finish up going through the menu system. All right, so we've got system set up. So if we go into there, we've got Bluetooth, Bluetooth Master and Bluetooth Group. Now that's to do with the phone app and I'm not reviewing the phone app in this episode. Um, I've given up reviewing phone apps because unless you've got lots of lights running off the app, you can't really test it. Plus, I also couldn't get the phone app to work on my Android phone. Okay, scrolling down this menu, we've got auto power off and we've got a Bluetooth reset as well as a factory reset. Now I love having a factory reset as an option on a light. It's always good to be able to get it back to a base point. All right, going back into the main menu, we've also got a USB port option here so we can turn the power on and off to the USB A port. And our last thing down on the menu is our DMX. So we can select our DMX on and off and we can also uh, select our DMX address. All right, so let's start going through all the data I've collected on this unit, starting off with the brightness. So at a distance of one meter set to 3,200 Kelvin, it comes in at 475 lux. At 5,600 Kelvin at a distance of one meter, it comes in at 480 lux. Now let's have a look at the CCT averages. Between 5,200 and 3,000 Kelvin, it is typically accurate to plus 186 Kelvin. Between 3,100 and 4,000 Kelvin, it is typically accurate to plus 171 Kelvin. Between 4,100 and 5,000 Kelvin, it is typically accurate to plus or minus 70 Kelvin. And between 5,100 and 6,000 Kelvin, it is typically out by minus 117 Kelvin. Now let's have a look at the TM30 color vector scores. Between 2,500 and 3,000 Kelvin, this came in at an average 93.8. Between 3,100 Kelvin and 4,000 Kelvin, it came in at a solid 93. 
between 4,100 Kelvin and 5,000 Kelvin, it came in at 93.4, and between 5,100 Kelvin and 6,000 Kelvin, it came in at 93.6. Now let's have a look at our white point or delta UV. So between 3000 and 4000 Kelvin, this comes in at minus 0 0.0011. Between 4100 Kelvin and 5000 Kelvin, it is typically out by plus or minus 0 0.0008 delta UV, which is very close to the Planckian curve. Between 5100 Kelvin and 6000 Kelvin, it is typically out by plus 0 0.0019 delta UV, which puts it above the Planckian curve, but below the daylight curve. Now let's take a closer look at our Kelvins, starting off with the lowest Kelvin you can dial in. When I dialed in 2,500 Kelvin, I got 2,592. With a TN30 color vector score of 93% color render, with an average 98% saturation. All of the individual CRI scores are above 90. And here is the wavelength. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin, I got 3,453 with an SSI score of 81. The TN30 color vector score was 93% color render with an average 102% saturation. With the individual CRI scores, R9, R11 and R12 were below 90. Here is the wavelength. And the delta UV was out by minus 0.0015. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,513, with a TN30 color vector score of 93% color render, with an average 103% saturation. With the CRI scores, R9, R11, and R12 were below 90. Here is the wavelength, and the white point was very close with a delta UV score of minus 0 0.0007. When I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got 5,480, with an SSI score of 73. The TN30 color vector was 94% color render with an average 103% saturation. With the CRI scores, R9, R11 and R12 were below 90. Here is the wavelength. And the delta UV was plus 0.0021, which puts it above the Planckian curve and below the daylight curve. When I dialed in the top Kelvin of 8,500 Kelvin, I got 8,141, with a TN30 color vector score of 92% color render and 98% average saturation. And here is the wavelength. Now let's take a look at how this dials in its color vectors, and it dials in the most accurate secondary color vectors I've ever come across in a review. Red, which should be zero, came in at two degrees. Green was smack on at 120 degrees. Blue was smack on at 240 degrees. Yellow was smack on at 60 degrees. Cyan, which should be 180 degrees, was very close at 188 degrees. And magenta, which should be 300 degrees, was only just off at 296 degrees. Now, unfortunately, it has awesome color vectors, but it has the worst desaturated white point that I've ever come across in a review, which lets the whole HSI mode down. It desaturates to an RGB mix with a CCT of 19,610 Kelvin. The white point is out by a crazy 0 0.0257 delta UV. And the TM30 is a total mess with a color vector score of 50% with a 120% average saturation. Well, that's another gear review done. See you on the next episode of Gaffering Gear.